again for joining us. Thanks for having me. I, I heard you were here before. And tell us about that a little bit. <laughs> a little bit. It's, it looks a little different. OK. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, how did uh, Square happen? Tell us about how you went from being a chemist to a CEO co-founder uh, founder, of Square. How did that happen? I always joke and say that my when you look at my LinkedIn and you see that I was a chemist and then I like went to Wall Street and then just came, came a tech founder, you probably think I'm a little crazy. A little bit. A little bit, yeah. But chemistry is really interestingly similar to product management, right? You have this kind of end goal. Sometimes it's really concrete, sometimes it's not. And what you do is you're looking for the building blocks and each building block is like a decision point you have to make a decision on, right? And so, you know, started out my career at Pfizer, I was a diabetes chemist, and I was a data scientist for the drug Lyrica, which I'm sure you guys have seen commercials on, because Pfizer is really good at marketing. Um, and I, I really wanted my, I went to business school, you know, from there, and did that because I really wanted to get closer to people. You know, when I was a discovery chemist, I was literally the first person that ever conceptualized, you know, the structure of a drug. But that means that my drug doesn't hit market for 20 years. Like, I would be retired by the time anything I did hit market. Wow. Yeah. So I was like, ooh, I want to go, I want to be close to the impact. So I was like, let me learn business. Thought I was going to go back into pharma and fell into Wall Street. So I was at J.P. Morgan um, and this program that Jamie Diamond, their CEO, had created to facilitate more general managers. And I ended up in digital product development, so led digital strategy and product for business making. So that's the division of Chase that makes five million American small businesses. And I was responsible for about a billion and a half of revenue initiative that came with like digitizing the whole business making experience. So, how did I get to squat? How? So much to the how. I might need a little bit bigger wine glass. We have, we have more, more <laughs> um, So, you know, getting to squad really backtracks a little bit to how I was raised. You know, so my parents immigrated from the islands, the Caribbean and Caribbean, and the thing that they really instilled in us, besides like hard work, humility, and kindness, was community. You know, I always joke and say that my house was the community center of Chapel North Carolina. Like, everybody was there all the time. It was like, you could be old, you could be young, you could be purple, you could be blue. But the power that I saw that community had on people, the people that my parents touched, that was, it was incredibly powerful. And so, whether it was the turbulence of my 20s or getting through three crazy degree programs, community was that one thing that like helped me keep my sanity. And so, when I was at J.P. Morgan, the application that I thought about was in the workplace. Because I because I rotated and supported a lot of different CEOs in the US and in Asia. The one thing that I found was that the places of the bank that had stronger community, stronger employee community, were actually stronger performing divisions. And I was like, okay, cool, we talk about community and now it's not this amorphous thing, it's a thing that actually has real meaning. But, um, so we started Squad as an enterprise software company that served like a social workplace tool for, for companies. So it was like a meetup.com. So you could put up a happy hour, you know, with tequila and, you know, yeah. Susan. Yeah, I, he's from Mexico and I, um, yes. I I did a tequila tasting tour in Mexico like six months ago. How'd it go? I don't, I didn't know if I could walk after. <laughs> that didn't work well. Yeah, it, it, like, I, like, yeah. I, Mexico has the best tequila. Well, yes. Yeah, obviously, we agree. Um, and so it was a place, it was a central repository for all activities and events, right, at a workplace. Um, and we learned two key things, because Squad has transitioned from enterprise to a consumer product. A few key things we learned. One was that, um, you know, we have a top-down SaaS and a bottom-up self-serve. As an experiment, we said, oh, we're gonna create our own self-serve community call it Squad Insiders. It's not tied to any of our customers, like SeatGeek and like Jet. We just are making it open to the community because we want to know what people are interested in from an events perspective. And that community, to our surprise, 
grew like 100% month over month. It was crazy. So he said, that's interesting. Um, we found out that almost everyone that was coming to our experiences and events were in their 20s. You know, they, they grew up on their phone. They have phones in like third grade, you know? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> and um, that offline connection and the ability to have a community where you had the offline connection was easy and it was a dope experience with authentic people. That was something that they were yearning for and missing. And so with no marketing, it just spread virally through word of mouth. On the other side, we found that, you know, in the workplace, even though we had 50% adoption of our software, users are trash creators of content, quality content consistently. So, Raphael, I mean, you wouldn't do this, but let's say you put up a happy hour at DigitalOcean, mm -hmm. and it's five o'clock, you say it starts at five o'clock, and then five o'clock comes running, you're not there. That makes us look bad. Yeah. Yeah. And so we realized that in order to circumvent what's happened to Meetup, where they, they're struggling with that quality content consistently, we had to impose much stronger views on what an experience actually entailed and control that. And we felt that that was more powerful you know, in our consumer population. And so the way I describe Squad is like a digital solo house for people in their 20s, where you can have really dope experiences, be really dope people, um, but do it in a way that's still chill and not so socioeconomically unavailable. I, I want to go back to that moment where you were still at the chase, okay. a gym woman, mm -hmm. and you said, we know this is, this is it. Uh, I want to I take this piece, the community piece that I've discovered, and make it my own. How did you scope? The, the pie in the sky that probably you had in your mind to actually create something and launch it. Tell, tell us about that. The ironic thing is that I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur in my life. When I was at MIT for business school, I had so many friends that were on the entrepreneurship track, and I was like, y'all are crazy. Y'all not gonna make no money. Like, you got me messed up. I want my 401k, my health insurance. And so I concentrated in finance, which is the irony. And so if I look at me from my, like, my personality and my career perspective, I've always been an entrepreneur, as I've always found really big problems or really big opportunities in the companies I was at, and said, hey, this is a problem, this is a huge opportunity to go after. And the execs usually gave me the leeway to say, okay, go build it, and I would get resources. And that's pretty much like how my career evolved. And then I just got to this one problem that was like itching at me. It's like, this is really big, but Chase wasn't the right environment to do it. Prior to then, I could find, you know, it was the right environment, it was an environment that worked. But I finally got to a point where I wanted to solve a problem and it, I wasn't in the right environment to do it. And so that's when I said, I was actually just at JP Warner earlier today. Like, they can't stay away from me. Like, they're always, they're Are always- Are you from them? <laughs> They're always like hit me up like, oh, we have this new big division. And I'm like, you, I'll take your money, but I'm not coming back. Nice. <laughs> so tell us what happened next, because many of our customers actually are uh, founders, but not necessarily have a tech background. Yeah. So what happened next? What was one of the biggest technological decisions that you had to make at that point that affected moving forward? So what happened next and what happened as I was thinking about transitioning from Chase was that I had to get used to the fact that people told me I was crazy. And people told me like, why are you doing this? Especially like being an immigrant child, right? Like this whole, you come to America and you get this big job and you like get stability, you get your 401k. You don't come to America and quit your other job. Yeah. And so I think mentally, the mental issues of starting a company are way bigger than like the actual like technical stuff. As far as technical, I come from a family of engineers and I actually managed a lot of engineers during the time that I was um, at JP Morgan. And so I was comfortable talking to engineers. I don't push code, I like do product development. So I had to recruit, like, I didn't even hire the first engineer until a few months after I had left. So I had to like recruit that first talent scope out what the product was. Um, we have our designer there sitting in the corner. 
Daniel, what we did is, you know, we actually created these like fake products on mobile screens using things like Envision. Great. Yeah, we like have people click through, we like watch their reactions. We're like, did that screen make you excited? Did that screen make you frustrated? And then that was how we decided like what to build. Nice. Yeah. We are looking for designers. <laughs> oh, well, that's awesome. uh, I want to go back again to when you talk about the process of getting it started and you feeling you, you people can tell you you're crazy. One of your uh, writings, you said, I did 320 sales speeches before landing my first five enterprise contracts. Tell me, out of those 320, at which one did you almost quit? And what can you do? None of them. In fact, I didn't even None know that them. stat until like 500 pitches. Whoa. Yeah. So. Tell us, how did you, how? How did you keep going? Maybe, I think founders are a little crazy. And I'll, I'll, I'll admit, maybe I have some of that. Um, so I had this HubSpot account that was expiring. And one of my team members was like, hey, we just got an email from HubSpot saying that our like, free version, or our 90% of our version is running out. Do you want to extend? I was like, no. Nah. But let me take a look at the data in there. And that's when I saw all of those rejections. I was just tracking them, but I had never looked at them holistically. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I got three when we do enterprise selling. I did 320 pitches for our first five customers, which included, our first five customers were like, we were and Jet, and once we had companies like that, then like, everybody in the grandma wanted to jump on. And so, I think that what kept me going was a few things, again, on the personal side. Like, founders always think that, like, starting a company is really about their products and their idea. A lot of times it's also about how you take care of yourself and who you surround yourself with. And so, I had kind of my, my box of cheerleaders that were, that were like, you know, it's okay, you got it. You know, but there would literally be a few months at a time where I felt like everybody told me no. And it, it, I'm not gonna say I was perfect at coping with it. Like I slept probably three to four hours a night each night, you know. You do, you have like freshman 15, I did like entrepreneur 15. <laughs> Um, and so the one thing that made me keep going though was the fact that even though we were being told no by the buyer, we have so much enthusiasm about the product from the end user. And I think sometimes that's a tricky thing with enterprise software. A lot of times you have your buyer and sometimes your buyer set is your user set, like payroll, you know, recruiting software. But a lot of times your buyer is, your, is a different person than your end user. And so I would go back and just say like, am I crazy? And like go back and talk to these end users who were actually begging their companies to use our software. Thanks. Um, speaking about technology, what uh, technical decisions have impacted Squad the most up until even today when after the pivot? So <laughs> At our last board meeting in San Francisco, that was when we just made the decision to ask um, enterprise software and ask our enterprise software all together. And we had to like have conversations, tough conversations with our customers, like because we had to get out of contracts and all these other things. And my lawyers were so nervous, and I was like, "Everybody, calm down. It's gonna be okay." And then we had to um, focus ex explicitly on the consumer product. But the biggest technology decision that we made was literally killing our whole web application and moving 100% to mobile. So there were some things in our stack that we didn't have to change, like Mongo DB on the back end, or, um, but we went from like React.js to React Native. They're, they're even, my team is even more oriented to web than they are mobile. And that was, we had to bring in a lot of mobile experts to help us with build, deployment, testing, just things that were nuanced for mobile. Um, but it's actually, the experience is so much more fitting because we were using web to kind of service these enterprise customers and our consumer users, 
but our consumer users were getting increasingly frustrated with the fact that they had they didn't have an app, right? And so I think that was a pretty dramatic decision that when I came back from San Francisco from the board meeting and I told the team on that Monday, there was like silence, you know? But it worked out because the mobile app was pretty dope. After the silence, was there a cheer or did they leave the room? It was it was a it was a silence and then by the end of the meeting with all the updates they were like they were like yo we're really excited like they're like this is good yeah because you also we also didn't want to focus on both so and to be another thing that we did is with enterprise we had so much feature creep with people almost like. I don't want to call enterprises bullies, but sometimes they're bullies and they'll say, well, in order to renew, we do need this added functionality. We do need, and a lot of times that added functionality doesn't benefit the end user. Right. It's like something random that the buyer put in and they're not product people. And so what we did is we actually scrapped about 85% of our code base and went through the process of really, really simplifying the experience. Every single thing, every single word that you see, every single button you can, touch on the application is incredibly intentional. Anything where we couldn't identify a very strong benefit for the user didn't make it in. And so the engineers actually got really excited about that. Thanks. Um, many product people I've worked with and that I've heard about um, are scared of decisions like this one. Um, what was your decision making process to say it's okay to trash all this? <laughs> um, how did you convince the, yourself, the board, and people after the silence? You know, we, we were talking about this a little bit, you know, in the green room. The green room? Yeah. The green room. Um, to be honest with you, there's this balance of quantitative and qualitative data that you'll get. And I think so often, people, especially product people, are very logic oriented people, they're very into the quantitative side of you know, what's the data telling us. But there's so much qualitative data. If you have qualitative over here and you have quantitative over here as a spectrum, on a spectrum, there's a judgment that you have to make somewhere. If you're dealing, dealing with my healthcare and stuff like that, that needs to be heavily quantitative, right? But if you're dealing with things that are experience driven and things that make people feel, you know, it's okay to be a little bit over here. And so three months prior to making that decision, I spent more time with our users and our members than I had in the past 18 months. And it wasn't, I was, I was never neglecting them. I just wasn't spending like every day or every other day talking to um, our, with our users, current and prospective. And so the one thing that made me super comfortable with that decision I wouldn't say super comfortable. I think it's like, there's no, no decision you're ever gonna be like 100% sure of. Like you just have to do it. You can't think about it too much. But I think the one thing that served as a catalyst was the fact that not only did we have this growth data, but when I was spending time with our members at our experiences, at our events, literally like the emotion that emanated from them, the enthusiasm they had, telling us that these were like the best things that they had ever attended in New York City, that they had never been to an experience that was as authentic and super dope and super real and all these words that I never thought to use to describe us. And feeling that, and then also, we had to kick people out all the time. Like everything that we, we ran, people were always staying. And so that made me comfortable. It's not something I can communicate in a board deck. It's not something I can communicate you know, in a presentation, but it was a feeling. And I think that there's this thing of like founders conviction. Founders generally have way more information than anybody else, you know, about what their users are feeling, how the finances are, et cetera, and you have to kind of own that. So when I went to the board, I said, listen, we did our three and a half million dollar round last year. We're gonna do our $10 million A in September. We are gonna drill down. I went to the board and I was like, we're gonna select either enterprise or this consumer product by March 31st. Great. And they were like, they were actually really excited too. Max? Yeah. They're giving me the five minute warning. Already? Jesus. Uh, so, we're gonna do a lightning round of questions. 
But first, I want to ask you to describe the following sentence as if a three-year-old's life depended on it. And this three-year-old had to understand the following concept. The characterization of an elucidation of a nuclear cyclic adenosine monophosphate signaling microdomain. Microdomain. He's oh, reading my thesis title when I did a master of pharmacology at Cornell. Um, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> so, what I would say to a three year old is that your body is made up of these things called cells, and they look like this. Uh -huh. And every cell has a center, yes. which is the nucleus, yes. right? And in that center, this is the thing that helps the cell keep going and going, so you can live and you can grow. That was pretty good. <laughs> I'm glad that three years and I'm gonna die. <laughs> okay, uh, lighting round is, I'm, I'm, I was inspired by Bernard Bivol and James Lipton from the Actors Studio. So here you go, so are you ready? Okay. First thing that comes to mind, what is your favorite business buzzword? Um, engagement. Okay, very big buzzword. What is your least favorite business buzzword? Authentic. I agree. Um, how do you seek inspiration? Read. Read and spend time with people. What's the, what was the last thing you read? Monetizing innovation. Well, a lot of buzzwords then. But it's a good book. Good. It's a good book. Yes. I've read it several times now in like two months. Nice. Write it down. Uh, what email subject do you love? Email subject? Email subject. The subject line. When you see the subject line and you're like, ah. Oh. Um, Google Alert of Isaac Watson. Oh. <laughs> uh, which one do you hate? Hey, Isaac, you need my services. <laughs> yeah, I do need those too. Uh, <laughs> What profession other than your own would you like to attend? What profession? Uh-huh. Ooh. That one I ripped it off from the questionnaire. Right? And my alter ego would be a talk show host. Great. Uh, which network? Netflix. And what would the topic? Just millennial life, lifestyle. Nice. Who would you want as your first guest? Um, not you. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. Um, that would be a terrible person. <laughs> you would, they would cancel your show. Easter egg. Easter egg. Mm -hmm. okay. um, which one, which profession would you not like to do ever? The president of the United States. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> Last one, if there was infinite capital at your disposal, mm. what would you do? I would build an engineering school in the islands. There's so much raw talent down there. My dad was fortunate to come to the US to get an engineering education, but I spent so much time in there, I'm a dual citizen, and the kids are just so smart, but the opportunity is limited to, you know, come to the US, which has been made harder um, since somebody took over. And um, yeah. Very much, Lisa. That was amazing. Thanks for sharing everything.